Oh, Jamie. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you. Hi, Terry. You can come on up. Yeah. Um, is anyone left except for go out on the, on the table? Are they coming this way? Yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna say a couple of things and I'll cue you and you can you can yeah. pop her up. Yeah. yeah, and I'll have to go all the way back there and hit both at the same time. So when they Oh you will? Oh, okay. Okay. Which which two? Um I have to hit the Oh you're doing it for him for he yeah. oh yeah, okay, I got gotcha. you. Cool. Okay. Okay, so it'll be a delay. Um Hi guys, I'm Dave Barnes. You know me. This is the Schaefer Gallery. And um I'm very, very, and I say this every time, very, very pleased uh, to present this show to you. Actually, could you turn off the, the music for me, Alyssa? It, it's wonderful light jazz music for looking at art, uh, although I was beginning to look for a martini, you know. Uh, okay. Uh, a few years ago, uh, I was sort of looking around for possible shows or showstoppers, to uh, bring to the Schaefer Gallery. And I came across this exhibit by Sayaka Gantz. It has been touring uh, in the United States for several years now. Uh, it is a show that has been well received throughout the country. Um, and it's a show that was a, a little big for the Schaefer Gallery. Uh, but I decided we could do it. We could handle it. We could put it up. We could make a big deal out of it. And uh, it originally came with a 23-foot blue whale. Oh. Yeah. And just before it was sent to us, apparently they took it off of the exhibit. Okay. Uh, oh, well, you didn't put it up. You know. <laughs> this was a very, very challenging install. Yeah. <laughs> it was a pain in the whatever. Uh, it, it, but it was well worth the labor and the effort to get it in the gallery. And I'm, I'm very, very pleased. I hope you are as well with how the gallery looks. But, you know, I couldn't have done it without the assistance of some very, very dedicated uh, crew members. OK, we had to put together a team for this show. And uh, uh, one of them, at least, is here tonight, Rodney Wood. I'd like to thank Rodney for helping put this show together. Oh, man. Applause. And then some. And Sienna. And Sienna, yeah. who is part of our staff. You know. Very important. And Ian Trevithan, who isn't with us tonight. He, I think he might show up eventually. Uh, who helped and put in long hours and worked very, very uh, hard to make this exhibit come together. Now, I have a 13-minute video that was produced by a art foundation. Uh, I believe they're, they're from Italy, uh, the uh, Geiger Foundation. And um, it's an interview with Sayaka Gantz, and it's done very, very well. And in this video, she explains where she's coming from with the work and basically what the work is all about. Um, I don't want to say too much because the video you know, basically says it all. But the thing about the work is that it comes from a very, very, um, very deep sensibility. The work is certainly about the aesthetics. I mean, uh, the basic of all art is that human tendency to, well, look at an electrical outlet and see a little face. Okay, do you see a little face? Everyone sees a little face. It's a human thing. And that ability, that need, or that proclivity to see things where they aren't really there, to see one thing relating to something else and seeing it, is what this show is really about. The idea of collecting materials that have one use and function. It's a spatula. And saying, no, 
It's not a spatula. It looks like a cheetah's ear. <laughs> That's the essence of this show, which is also the essence of human creativity. And the other sensibility that comes through her work, and she'll talk about it just a little bit, is that she has a very Japanese uh, connection to materials, okay? In Japan, in the traditional Shinto religion, one of the important planks of Shintoism is that everything has an essence, or in the West, we would call it a spirit. So there is the essence or the spirit of bamboo. There's the essence or the, or, or the uh, material. Even plastic, even man-made materials have their own spirit, have their own essence. And she wanted to bring out the essence and get us to see plastic not as an inert, functional thing that we make easily cast off objects with, not something that we throw away without any thought, throw away randomly to create huge piles of refuse, and plastic doesn't decay, so it, with things that are going to stay in our trash heaps forever. But she wants us to see plastic as something that also has a kind of a spirit, has a soul, has a beauty, has something in it that is of value. Because she believes that if we value something, we're least likely to, or therefore we're less likely to cast it away. Okay? And that's, I think, a wonderful sensibility, and I love the depth. So it's not just these are wonderful, creative things. They're also things that have a message to them, okay? So I'm going to shut up, and I'm going to let you watch this video. So, uh, Alyssa? Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> Never mind. Do I need to talk some more then? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, <laughs> actually, there are some good seats up here. It's not too close because it's a small screen. So, you know, don't be embarrassed to come up here and, and sit in the front. Um, we've been uh, actually uh, paying on this show for a couple of years uh, because it, it, it's one that's a little bit out of our range of our budget to do in a one year's uh, a budget. And so we've been paying on it a little bit for several years to bring it together. Okay, we ready to go? Okay, then without further ado. In Shintoism, we believe that all the objects and the natural um, elements and creatures have spirits. So even inanimate objects have spirits. And uh, we were told uh, in kindergarten that uh, objects that are thrown away in the trash before their time will go and cry in the middle of the night. And so as a child, when I was five, and I felt so, so sorry for these objects. I collect all materials uh, such as like the kitchen utensils, like spatulas and spoons, or um, this is from like a CD rack. Very cheap coat hangers that I buy from the thrift store, like maybe a dollar for 20 of them or something. These kind of objects I collect from the thrift stores. Uh, maybe I go about once a month and uh, right now I know what kind of shapes and forms that I need. So I usually try to look for these curvilinear forms that are uh, very organic looking and um, nothing that's uh, very flat. In my basement I have very many plastic bins that um, are all sorted, so all the blues are together, all the blacks are together. The second part of the process is making an armature. Now when you look at the penguin, uh, you can see the metal mesh that goes through like this. And that's the structure that's underlying, that supports all the plastic parts together. I do a lot of research, uh, either on the internet or um, in the books, 
uh, I look at many, many photographs and um, study the silhouette of the animal. In larger works, like the horses, I use uh, steel wire or aluminum wire. The armature for the white horse took maybe three months. The final part is the part that I love the most. I try to align so that every piece that's very long are going in the same direction and that really enhances the, for, uh, the sense of motion in my sculpture. I try very carefully to um, place each item and then I step away, look at it, and then I come back and change things. Uh, yes, I love doing that. Uh, I've always loved puzzles um, when I was a child. When two different things fit together very well, perfectly, um, it's such a joy. Before plastic, I was using uh, scrap steel and iron, but at the time I was feeling that um, my work was getting to the point where it's very repetitive and I needed to change something. As a part of my research, I went to many thrift stores uh, near the school that I was going attending for graduate program. And uh, at one of the stores, I found uh, this plastic chain. This is plastic, but um, this is the kind of uh, material that in, in metal, I used a lot of for my metal animals. It's great for like the neck or the spine. And I think when I found this chain, this was the moment when I really thought, oh yes, I can use plastic instead of metal. So then, as I started collecting, I just started to see more and more possibilities. When I was working with uh, two friends on a public art project in Ohio, uh, we tried to get the community involved. And so, on, in the newspaper, we advertised saying, you know, please give us your plastic from your homes that you don't want anymore. And um, some people donated uh, these um, more like maybe like wine glass, margarita glass. Since we already had a few of these, I started uh, stacking them up in different ways and they started to look almost like, uh, like uh, a string of beads. Very pretty. And so I had this idea to make many, many strings of these kind of uh, plastic stemware and bowls and plates. And, uh, and then I got this opportunity to show um, a very long string of these objects. When I saw those inside of a uh, gallery window, then there were lights behind the plastic. And when the lights came from behind the plastic, they glowed almost like stained glass and they're so beautiful. So then, you know, it gave me an idea that, oh, I want lights inside of the plastic. And then something exciting happened. Well, um, I've been friends with Jim Mertz, who is a kinetic sculptor, for a while. I look all around me and I see sailboats sailing, I see a school of fish, I see a um, uh, construction site with cranes and things like that, and jazz musicians playing, and to me, they're all doing a dance. They're all moving together and doing a dance. So I see that dance and I say, what makes that move, those invisible connections? And so I'm, I'm looking at those invisible connections between things and trying to express that in the sculpture. And uh, using math uh, like the Fibonacci series to, uh, it's in nature and it's math that describes nature. And I 
try to find uh, math and algorithms that describe the motion and uh, let people see that. And then I had this idea, well, oh, I already have this exhibition scheduled, and what if the gym could make something move for me? Yes! Oh. Each string rotate independently, and then they change the speed, go faster, go slower, maybe uh, go in a different direction. And then the whole structure, the whole set of three, will also turn in different directions and at different speeds. The magic happens when I'm doing the computer programming. For this, I use a C and C++. 90% of the world is done in C++, so it's very good. And I've used it since... 1990, very old language. When I was uh, in elementary school, I used to want to be a painter. That's what I told uh, when a grown-up asked me, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I want to be a painter. High school, college, and then we started to become maybe more realistic. Then, I, at the time, I think I was very interested in animals. So I thought, well, maybe I can be a veterinarian. Maybe I can uh, work uh, like in a circus, like animal trainer. Yeah. When I look at an animal, uh, I think more about the joy of being alive, the movement, the freedom. And um, it's more like the fundamental level of existence. If we start to think of these kind of plastic as valuable, then we will uh, treat these objects better and we will think and find ways to dispose of them better. Um, and uh, I think it all starts from us saying that, okay, this can be something valuable and good and beautiful. I want to convey the message about the environment in a fun and um, inspiring way because um, when I'm given a negative incentive, when I'm told that if you, if, I, if you don't do this, something terrible is going to happen, I'm going to be punished, then maybe I will go and still do something, but the very minimum of what's required of me. Uh, but if instead, if it's uh, turned into a game, for instance, that I can really enjoy, or you know, if, if there's a reason for me to want to do this instead of having to do it. I think also growing up in several different countries and having to adapt and uh, make new groups of friends, I've, uh, I've acquired a very strong uh, yearning for a place to belong to. And that's something I want to give to these plastic objects, a place to belong to again and to have a second chance at becoming something alive and beautiful. So if, if we think of God, and if God is our creator, then to these objects, we are like God because we created these. And yet, we treat these objects, we use it you know, when it's convenient for us, and then we throw them away, when, and then don't even think about it. And so that's, that's really cruel. And I don't understand how we can ask our God to be kind to us when we are so cruel to these objects that we create. Very fun, very whimsical, a very unique uh, creative personality. I was very impressed. And I did have personal communication from her this week. 
and she asked me to tell you guys that she was really, really uh, glad that you came to see her work mm -hmm. and that she wanted you to, to know that, that, that she was here and that she would have loved to have been with us to like uh, play with her animals. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, don't literally play with her animals, please, <laughs> but uh, please take some time and interact with the animals and have some goodies and please take an a, a opportunity to talk with each other. So uh, thank you so very much for coming this evening. Yes. Where does she currently reside? People keep asking me the question, and I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. She travels a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, she's. Uh, uh, I'm not sure where she is at the moment okay. because, and, and she's lived in three different countries, and I know that she travels abroad a lot and has workshops and, and uh, things like that here and there.